episode four, Time, Space, and the Other Place. In a space too far from anything to be nothing, a blue light shines into the void. Through the shadows, shapes appear. People, stories, wonders, and mysteries. Live from Elgin, Illinois, in the Blue Box Cafe, it's Tales from the Blue Light. I'm your host, James Wilder. So every month on the show, we showcase a brand new sci-fi, horror, and fantasy story by me, um, as well as something from our guest, Rihanna. Today, it's just me. Uh, so we're going to be leading up to the Doctor Who premiere, where this is stories by me, and a little bit of Doctor Who poetry to set the tone to get things going. <laughs> So, these stories come from all over time, space, and other realities. They're all called here through this blue light. See, this light is a special one. It bends our world into a place where stories become real. A liminal space where our own dreams can take form. We glide between these realities, these possibilities, and we get stories. So that's what we do here. And we're excited to bring you what you have. But first, I've been practicing magic for, since last week's show, so I thought I'd give you uh, one to try out here, guys. Think of a number. Any number. No, multiply by 5, divided by 3, add 2, take the square root, add point zero two. add x, divide by y, play Beethoven's fifth symphony, multiply it again by 6. Okay, what do you guys get? Okay, I got a picture of a cat wearing a funny hat. Honestly, I don't think I could be any worse at math, but here we are. Um, so that's that for magic tricks. Right, well, back to what I actually have a degree in. Calling stories from across time, space, and reality through a blue light. Now that was a heck of a college education. So, let's see what the blue light is called for us today. Ah. So today, we're going to be starting with our horror story. Usually we save that for last when it's dark, but we're going to get this going before all the little kids get here for the Doctor Who here. So, today we're going to start with a story that we're calling The Exorcism of Jennifer Dawn. The rain had started when Father Benoff was three steps out of the car. He knew he should have parked closer. He pulled the front of his coat tighter and leaned his head down as he walked towards the house. This was dirty work. Work he hated doing, but not many men were qualified for it anymore. Not many men even believed in it anymore. You're lost in the past, Jack, Father Williams had said. The young guys don't take you seriously and you need people to take you seriously. You know how many times I've stood up for you. The new guys won't have your back like I do when I retire. They won't be able to bail you out the next time you get into trouble. I won't get into trouble, Jack muttered. Of course you'll get into trouble. Maybe not this year, but it'll happen. I know you, Jack, better than you know yourself. You need allies. Not just friends, allies. A real friend will tell you when you screw up. An ally will make sure nobody knows. Which one do you need? Jack did in this case, but he nodded. So cool with all the spiritualism crap, demons and stuff. Nobody actually believes that anymore. We don't go through the motions about it. Sure. But it's not like horror movies. No one is really possessed. Oh, if only that were true. Father Benioff got to the door and knocked. A woman opened it. The bags under her eyes could have fit clothes for a 10 day trip. Father, thank you so much for coming. She ushered him inside. He entered, and she took his coat. They didn't have a coat rack by the door, so she carried the sopping coat, grabbed the hanger, and hung it on a floor lamp. The lamp leaned awkwardly. A man rose from the chair. Uh, thank you for making it here so quickly, the man said. Mr. and Mrs. Don, glad I could, as well. Just Mrs. Don, she piped in awkwardly. My daughter's father is no longer in the picture. That's Jeffrey. He's been here helping out. Benoff smiled and shook their hands. Internally, he knew they were living in sin. Mrs. Don was still married. He didn't expect to see her husband. He'd heard he'd run off with one of the baristas from the nearby coffee shop, taking quite a bit of cash with him, too. He was 15 years older than the barista. He had to wonder how the trip was going. Suddenly, his head began to hurt. He lost where he was. He saw them on a huge boat in the Caribbean. They looked out at the ocean. She tans. 
She sees the man she's run off with. Suddenly, he's not so mysterious and magical now that he's not sneaking out back to run his hands down her sides. He's old, insecure, pumping himself up with a 19-year-old who never left her hometown before. She sees a boy her own age playing ukulele to a girl on the deck. She feels like she's made a mistake. They spend the night together, and as they're curled up, the ship rocking from side to side, he tells her about his daughter. His eyes are wild with fear. He had to run away. He had to get out of there. The barista thinks about his wife and his daughter. They're alone, dealing with hell. The last of the magic fades, but she's trapped in a boat with them till the end of the journey. She looks out the portal of the ocean and realizes she's run away with a coward. She decides when she gets back, she'll leave her hometown for good. Father, he blinked. Jeff and Mrs. Don were staring at him. I, I'm sorry, I, I get visions sometimes. Images of things that are happening or have happened. It's, it's one of the reasons I was trained for this job. She smiled, hopefully, but there was pain behind it. I hope to God you can. He hoped the same. Show me your daughter's room, Mrs. Don. Please, call me Kelly. The room was a standard seven-year-old girl's room. Well, for the modern day. There were a lot of stuffed animals, Legos, dolls, posters of her favorite characters, from ponies to bow-tie time travelers and armored space ruffians. It would have seemed more normal if everything wasn't knocked over, the posters torn, the walls lined with messages and dry blood, that sort of thing. Get out, reckoning is upon you, ha ha hell. Father Benoff took a deep breath. He held a crucifix in his hand and stepped across the threshold. Father, a deep voice bellowed from the child. What a happy day to see you here. It's Easter, isn't it? The day it's hot, doesn't it? The Easter egg roll was going well. Father Benoff laughed and took another sip of his lemonade as the children ran across the church lawn. That was when Deacon Dave pulled on his sleeve. He looked at the taller man who was glowering at him. I have a concern. He didn't even say father. Jack knew it wasn't good. Jack snapped back to the room. His head was spinning. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a pill, shoving it in his mouth. Clever, but that will only help you out so much, Father. Benioff closed his eyes and began to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, a bookcase slammed down next to him. Now, my Father, I know why you're here, but why am I here? No one ever asks me that. The thing possessing Jennifer made her puppet body crawl out from the covers like a spider. Have you ever considered that I might be here for just as much of a reason as you? Ignore the demon. Its words are lies. He knows that. Jack needs it to focus on the words, the method. You don't talk back to a demon. You don't give it that power, that purpose. He continued the prayer. It kept talking. But you, you've always had a problem, haven't you? You see things. You see who I really am. A wheel of fire with eyes scraping his skin. Its arms reach out from the flame. It spokes so the bones are whispers. And as it turns, so does his stomach. It screeches and gasps the names of stars and the positions of their orbits. It turns in the heavens and on the earth and in his mind. It is something far beyond him. It screams. You can see me, the child says. His mouth dribbling spit onto the bed. It grins. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. What an arcade notion. I want a fundamentally dishonest one. Come from you. He would tune it out. He wouldn't listen. You're going to listen because, Father. She leapt from the bed, thick lines of spit trailing after her like spider webs. She grabbed under the ceiling and scuttled across it, coming down on top of her dresser, her tongue hanging down farther than it should go from her mouth. I didn't come here with a child. There are lots of children. He stared at her, the sick, grinning thing. Then leave this poor girl. If you don't want her, leave. They kept grinning. I'm not strong enough to take the body of an adult for my vessel. So I'll have to take her now. Coward. It left. Hypocrite. Leave her. You don't understand the nature of angels, mortal. I understand it. I've researched it. I know your place in the heavens and you forsake them. You have fallen hard and fast. You are a pathetic creature. It scampered towards him. He held his ground. You claim to know so much, but now am I here? You took over this child. That's not how it works. You know better. I'm weak. I'm old. I think you're so wrong. How am I here? Jeff frowned. Just because 
be in front of you. Doesn't mean you want it. It doesn't mean you got it all. He began to pray again. Whosoever will be saved for all things that is necessary, that hold the Catholic faith, which faith except every one, do be whole and undefiled. Undefiled. Interesting wording. Without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly in the Catholic faith of this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, either confounding the persons, they're dividing the essence, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. How many is that now? Or do you count yourself in the number? I do God's work. The thing raised itself up, the child's body lifting from the floor like a badly strung marionette. Then ask yourself, why am I here? The work of demons is evil. I was once a soldier of God, it said, the bellowing voice so odd. Blood began to trickle down from its eyes. But I fell. Do you know what it's like, my father? All I did was say no to God, but you done I do the Lord's work. Leave the girl be gone. The marionette stands dropped. The little girl lifted her head up, and Jennifer grinned at him, her teeth bloody, her eyes red. He won't be gone, Father, because I don't want him to be yet. Because neither of us are done with you. The lock on the door shut. The demon's voice returned. How far have you fallen? Then when she was in danger, she asked me for help instead of angel. You know. You know what you've done, Father. You've heard people. Voice in your hell. You made a sermon about why people need your views, that it was the sin of the culture. But you know that. It's your sins. The ones that you covered up. The ones that were covered up in the last town you were in and the town before that. Jennifer never knows about those sins. Not for me specifically, but she knows. And I'm very, very unhappy, Jennifer yelled. Father Benioff took a step back. You don't know what you're saying. This is uh, he said, it's ridiculous. I'm your what? She said. You're under the Easter egg hunt. The deacon knew. He called Father Williams and they moved him again. It's going to be hard this time. You couldn't have waited a little longer. Jack sweated. He didn't know what to say. He ran. The demon laughed. This is my penance. I'm helping to cleanse your church, doing some community service. Jack backed up. You're a demon. I was an angel. People change. Sometimes they can go back. I can change, Jack stammered. Can you? Jennifer asked. How many people have you hurt? How many exorcisms are even real that you've done? He didn't know. He shook the lock. The demon touched him. He saw fire as far as the eye could see. He saw an endless sea of loneliness with no end, no hope, no help. A darkness as deep as the ocean, where his lungs gasped endlessly, but never gave out. He was spinning there endlessly, eternally, and screamed. So I'll offer you a choice. The demon said. Jennifer's mother looked over at her daughter as she flipped the pancake. Are you okay? She nodded in reply. She was focused on the TV. Shocking news today as Father Jack Benioff has turned himself in this morning for a shocking list of crimes, including Jennifer turned the TV off. How much longer will your um, your friend be staying? Jennifer shrugged. Till our work is done. You've already gotten so many. How many is that now? Jennifer asked. Seven, her mouth said in a low voice. See, that's not that many, the same mouth replied. More to do. Kelly Don nodded. Could you clean your room before you bring the next one over, please? Jennifer frowned. But the ambiance! You can worry about setting the tone after you make your bed, young lady, but no buts! Jennifer nodded and walked to her room. Find the next one, she whispered to her hands. Our work is not yet done. Thank you. All right. So, um, now we're going to have a special interview here. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, there it is. You know what? Uh, your EV. Oh, we're doing that one? Okay. Yes. All right. So uh, we're lucky enough to have a special guest with us this week, just in time for Easter. Uh, please welcome our good friend, the Easter Bunny. Hey, hang on a second. Let, let the Easter Bunny uh, get ready. Yeah, so you know, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Easter Bunny.
Christopher Bunny. Uh, he's a big deal in a lot of places. Uh, you may have seen some of his work in um, your living room, um, Walmart, um, you know. Walgreens. Wal Walgreens. Walgreens, yeah. yeah. Walgreens, Walmart. Everywhere there's walls, actually. And greens. Big day for fans of walls. All right. Hey, hey, what's snapping? <laughs> oh, it's great to have you, Mr. Bunny. Hey, hey, I'm in a rush. You better hop to it. Oh, of course. So, I've always wondered, uh, bunnies don't actually lay eggs. So, why do you bring them to people for Easter? I've heard a lot of theories that people used to use them as fertility symbols, that they're a symbol of price renewal, that they're part of a marketing gimmick. Nah, nah, pal. You got it all wrong. See, the egg thing? It's not why we brought the eggs, that's the question. It's why we have so many to begin with. Uh, wait, wait, not unpack that. See, we give our eggs because we have so many. I still have a whole bunch in my living room. I can't give them away fast enough. And let me tell you, a whole holiday with eggs is a dream come true for us, buddies. Uh, what was that? Long ago, a chicken tried to cross the road. So you get to the other side? Obviously. If you know, hold up. <laughs> Obviously, I'm shaking this too much, so sorry. So, obviously, but if you know anything about chickens, they aren't that bright. So one day a chicken is crossing and there's a car coming. The chicken stops to pack a piece of moldy toast on the road and she's gonna be roadkill. So I hop in and shove her out of the way. Turns out, guess it's amazing. I, I really don't know where you're going with this. She's the queen of all chickens. She has all her people give me one egg every year. All chickens everywhere. I don't know what to do with them. I've got eggs here, I've got eggs there. I actually brought you a gift basket for having me on the show. Oh wow, well, thank you. It's 79 eggs. You, you're welcome. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to get ready for an Easter egg hunt. Trust me, I'll be putting out extra for those kids. The more I can get rid of, the better. Uh, uh, Mr. Rabbit, wait, would you uh, like to say anything else to those kids out there? Kids. Someone, if someone ever tells you a joke about why the chicken crossed the road, you tell them to make the Easter Bunny lose his day off. See ya! Oh, goodbye, Mr. Rabbit. Bye-bye. Well, that was fun. Uh, and the Easter Bunny is, in fact, the sponsor of today's show. Easter. It may mean a lot to you. Or nothing. The start of spring. A religious celebration. Or just another day on the calendar. But whatever it is to you, it's a great day to eat eggs. Eggs are a great source of protein, can be cooked in lots of different ways, and every one you eat means the Easter Bunny has more room in his house so he can finally get his Nintendo Switch hooked up to the TV. Easter, eat your darn eggs. Oh, <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move on to the next story in our repertoire. Uh, this is the fantasy section of our show where we can take you to a faraway land and the journey of a new hero in a piece we're calling The Legend of Mids. It was two past midnight when they pulled him from his bed. Miz awoke to the sounds, the scratching of the goblin's claws against the wooden floor of their house. She ran from the room and saw her brother being dragged towards the door. Her mother walked in behind her, her shoulders slumped. Come on, Mom, help me! Miss yelled, grabbing the fire poker and rushing towards the goblins. They weren't expecting a 12-year-old girl to bash them over the head with a poker, so when it did, it took them a second to register it. Ow! The goblin yelled as she whacked the next goblin. You're not taking my brother, she cried. Wasn't my father enough? She wailed and wailed till the biggest goblin reached out, grabbed her poker in mid-swing, and shoved her down to the floor. The other goblins rubbed their heads and checked to see if anyone was dead. Everyone being alive, they thought of what to do with the little girl. Her mother looked on, her eyes dead, waiting to see what would happen. Should we, uh, gut the run? One asked, kicking the girl with his sharp foot. Nah, we can't bend the human heart too much. We can't get anyone to work the mines. Kick her a bit more, make sure she learned her lesson. So they did kick her, and dragged her brother out. After they finished, Mrs. Mother picked her up, walked out of her room, and carried her to her bed. Why didn't you fight back, Mom? Miss cried. She tucked her in. They took Dad no chin. They beat me. How can you just let him? Her mother shook her head. It's not our place to fight back against the goblins. 
We love under their rule, and that's simply the way of the world. We must know our place. We have no power against them if we fight back. We only make things worse for ourselves. We must simply hope they'll be merciful to us. She patted Miz on the shoulder and went back to bed. Miz stared at the ceiling, her heart racing. She wouldn't let this stand. They couldn't bow to the goblins forever. She thought of all the other men in the village who'd been taken, all the brothers and fathers. She tried to get up, but her wounds were too great. She would rest. She would rest, and then she would find a new path. Elder Hall was pouring tea when young Miz came in to see him in the meeting hall. He saw she'd recovered from her injuries finally, and she looked grimmer. Child, what brings you in to see me this day? She bowed and then rose and put her hands on her hips. I want to know why we haven't fought back against the goblins. They took my brother, took my father, and they've taken so many others. Why don't we fight back? Elder Hom frowned. I wish it were that easy, child. It's not difficult because the goblins are especially dangerous foes, because we've lost the will to fight them back and the weapons to do so. They take the strongest men from the village and use them to mine for iron to make their own weapons in honor. We have to trade them huge portions of our harvest every year just to get the money to get the implements we need to farm for next year. Miz sucked down to her knees. So it's hopeless. We can't win. My mother was right. Elder Hom laid his hand on her head. Well, don't get ahead of yourself. I didn't say that. He pulled her chin up and gestured for her to follow him. He took her to the room of scrolls where the records of their people were kept. He scanned the rows of scrolls before pulling one out and rolling it out across the table. Miz squinted at the scroll. She recognized some of the words and most of the letters, but a lot of it seemed strange to her. This scroll is in the ancient tongue of our people, the Houdin. When the Houdin first came to this land, there was peace between us and the goblins. But that all changed when a great goblin warlord rose up and overthrew the ruler of their people by force. We were unready, having regarded the goblins as friends, and they trampled over us. Since then, we've waited for a hero brave enough to defeat the goblin warlord. I'm brave enough, Miss Yell. Shh, not too loud. You don't want the other villagers to know what you're up to if you are. So, you think you're brave enough to take on the goblins? Ms. nodded. Someone has to, but I, I can't take them all by myself. There's too many. I don't even have a weapon. The old man stroked his beard. There is a legend. One I was not sure I should tell you in case you ran off without hearing everything I had to say. Do you promise to listen? She nodded. Good. Legend says that there is a cave in the hills where the goblins have kept the one thing that can overthrow their rule locked away. Miss gasped. A magic sword! It does not say, but it's powerful enough that they keep it well guarded. So, if you're brave enough, you may yet learn. He pointed a picture of a rocky hill on the school, a pattern of three lines with a circle intersecting the middle one carved into the rock. Look for this. It will lead you to what you seek. He reached under the table and pulled out an old, dusty chest, which he opened. Fishing around in it, he drew out a wooden shield and an old sword, about the right size for Miz. The journey is harsh. So make sure you stay safe. Miz grabbed the items and immediately began testing them out, slicing the air with a heavy blade. But remember, Miz, not everything is how it first looks on the surface. Your first instincts might not always serve you best. Miz held the sword up. I promise you, I will bring back our families. Elder Hom bowed his head. And I wish you luck, young one. Miz left the gates of the village and looked up at the hills. The goblins looked in holes and caves scattered throughout them, but she knew she had to find only one particular hill. She walked into the fields and began her journey. The walk was hard. The only path between the hills and the village was guarded by goblins, so she had to walk through the tall grass to avoid them. She wore her leather boots, so at least wasn't tearing up her feet. She shoved another bunch of grass inside and sighed. This would be a long trip. That was when she heard it. The growl of a higher pool. They ate the livestock in the village, and sometimes children. She could picture the great herd beast from memory, even though she could only see the grass rustling. 
Its four hooves could knock your head in, and its sharp teeth could tear your throat out. Its five eyes made it hard to fool, as two were in the front and one was in the back, and the other two were on either side of its head. The row of spines coming from its back posed extra danger, just in case the rest wasn't enough. She drew her sword and shield. She could hear her breath, and she knew it knew exactly where she was. She listened for the growl, turning in its place, trying to follow the higher hunt. Then the sound stopped. There was only her breath. She barely turned as it lunged at her from the side. She brought up her shield, and it knocked her to the ground, its front hooves beating at her shield relentlessly as it bowed its head down to try to bite around it. Flailing with her sword, she felt it hit something, and the beast scurried back, yelping in surprise. She set up to see if she could cut his front leg. Rising, she faced the higher one, which growled at her, and they began to circle each other. Her heart was growing harder than she'd ever felt it. Her vision was growing fuzzy, like she was going to pass out. It could bite and kill her. She felt the urge to run that held back. If she did, it would only pounce on her and devour her. She had to win. She fainted forward, lunging with her shield. The higher one snapped at her, at her other side. But she was ready, and plunged the sword into the roof of its open mouth, sending blue blood out the spurts from the wound. Its eyes all went wide, and it thrashed its head, but she held tight, and the blade's hold became wider. She pushed it deeper till the hilt was buried in his head, cutting her hand on the beast's teeth. The light faded from its eyes, and it collapsed on the ground. It is panted. She'd won! Her first kill and battle, her first victory! She fell to her knees and tried to let her body calm down. She hadn't expected to be so much blood when she stabbed the higher and it was all over her. She took a few minutes to calm down, and then she got back to work wiping the creature's blue blood off the grass and pulling the sword out from the beast's head. That took the longest, as it was pretty stuck in hard. When she finished, she pulled out a few of the beast's teeth as trophies. She put them on a necklace or something to show her victory. A pity she couldn't take the head, but she was in a rush to save her village. She continued the trek. Night came, and she made camp under a villagru tree, and ate a dinner of its fruit, cracking open the shells to eat the pudding-like inside and chew on the seeds. She slept well, and awoke to the sunrise, where the light of dawn illuminated the sign she'd been looking for since she started. Three lines, with a circle intersecting the middle one. She got up and scarfed down a quick breakfast of jerky and hardtack before running towards the hill. She didn't expect it to find it so quickly, but she was not complaining. Drawing her sword, she neared the stone the symbol was carved into. There didn't seem to be an entranceway, so she circled around the whole hill. Nothing. She climbed it. Nothing. She descended back to where she'd started and looked at the stone again. She pushed on the symbol, but nothing happened. She tried to turn the rock, but no luck. Finally, she leaned down and looked closer at the carving. The middle line sure did look like it was carved deeper than the others. Miz took her sword and tried sliding it into the hole. When the hilt hit the stone, she heard a click. Miz grinned and jiggled the sword. The circle intersecting the line began to turn with the sword as she jiggled. She turned the sword all the way till the lock stopped moving, and the side of the hill opened up. Pulling the sword out of the lock and tightening the straps on her shield, she entered in the cave. Torches lined the passage, a sure sign that the place was still occupied. She walked slowly, carefully, making sure her footfalls weren't loud enough to alert any goblins to her presence. She entered into a large room from the passage, where two goblins sat sleeping at a table, large mugs of foul-smelling liquid in front of them. The weapons were sitting on the table, two heavy maces, but they weren't the most interesting thing in the room. That would have to be the small goblin, maybe only Miz's age, sitting in a cage at the far end of the room. She looked up at Miz, her eyes wide with surprise, but she didn't speak. In fact, she put her clawed hand over her mouth. She was wearing a fine dress, probably stolen from the village. But why was she in a cage? Hmm. Miz didn't have time to find out. She needed to find the hidden item that could beat the goblins. She looked around the room and saw a sword mounted on a plaque on the wall. It looked fancy, glorious even. There were jewels mounted on the hilt and a fine carving on the handle. 
a magic sword. Miz tiptoed over to the sword, aware the goblin girl was watching her the whole time. She wasn't sure why she hadn't alerted the guards, but maybe she was just mad at them for putting her in a cage. Miz put a finger to her lips, and the goblin girl mimicked her and nodded. Good. She was in the clear. Stepping to the wall, Miz reached up to pull down the sword. She couldn't quite reach it, so she grabbed a stool and, as quietly as she could, set it down below the sword and climbed it. Finally, she pulled the sword off the rack and immediately lost her balance and fell off the stool. Ugh. She was lucky she didn't pale herself as she tumbled. The sword clattered to the ground next to her, and as she groaned, it felt like she bruised something. The guards woke up. Miz scampered up, picking up the oversized sword and brandishing it at them. The guards were surprised to see her, picking their maces up off the table and bearing down on her. I told you we shouldn't have drunk so much, Nob. I told you we should have set an alarm, Bob. This little human has come for the princess, so you know what that means, Nob. Nob grinned. Smashy time! Miz frowned. I didn't come for a princess, I came for the magic sword. The goblin stopped, looked at each other, and laughed. She thinks she's got a magic sword, she does. That's a my comical dog. Mighty comical dog. It's not funny. Oh, I'll smite you with it. The goblins laughed again and came at her with their maces. Miz rolled out of the way of the first goblin and ducked the second. She tried to swing the huge sword, but she lost her balance and the front tip of it just fell to the floor. She struggled to try to lift it again. That's no magic sword. It's for display purposes only, it is. It's not even sharp. Miss wanted to argue, but she couldn't actually get the sword up again, so she dropped it and drew the sword elder Hob had given her. Okay then, I'll fight you with my own blade. She'd have to bring the sword back to the village and find someone strong enough to wield it. Nob swung at her again, and she hopped to the left as the mace came down with a heavy thud on the ground. Miz didn't hold back, and he to slice at his arm, severing it mid forearm. Oi! He yelled. What's going on? She ran in, passed his limb, and jabbed her sword into his throat. She pulled it out and scampered back as his body fell to the floor. Gob was Gob smacked. Miz glared as she bore down him, leaping, pulling her blade back, and then burying it in the goblin's chest. She kept pushing as the goblin fell onto his back and he stopped moving. Miz knelt on the goblin, panting. This felt different than fighting the wolf. The goblins had talked. They wouldn't have put her into the they would have ground her into the floorboards with the maces, but it felt different. She stayed there for a full minute before the princess spoke. You didn't come to rescue me. Miz looked over. I don't even know who you are. I was told there was something that could defeat the goblin warlord in this cave. Um but it must be hidden. It's not hidden, she replied. It's me. Miz brushed back her hair with her bloody hands. What? Long ago, the golems were ruled by a queen, but then a warlord came and destroyed our peaceful way of life. He killed the queen, took the throne with the inner daughter, and all the golems of the land celebrated the end of his reign because she would succeed and we could all return to the way things were. So the warlord put his daughter here in the cage. Then his son put his daughter here. Then his son. It's the destiny of the first daughters of the warlord to live and die in this cage. I don't understand. Why, why don't they just kill you? The queens of our people aren't just rulers. We're the people's connections to the eight gods. Duh! If he killed us, he'd be committing blasphemy. So instead, he's just protecting us. Miz frowned. That's horrible. You've been in that cage your whole life? The princess nodded. I've had, I have, but I've had books, so it could have been worse. I don't really think that makes it, um, better. Miz searched the guards' bodies and found the keys to the cage. If I let you free, you can release the human slaves who have worked the mines? The princess nodded. Of course. It's time to make peace. The goblin warlord drunk deeply of the cup of fine dung wine that had been prepared for him. Life was great. There was nothing to worry about, and... My leech, the god said, running up to him. Uh, we, we have a situation. Uh, the princess? The one who can overthrow you? Yes, uh, she is and she's marching on your cave with everyone uh, who you rule over. Send the guards! 
Uh, she told them the gods will smite them if they don't turn on you. Um, so they, they turn on you, actually, sir. The warlord blinked. He never expected he'd actually have to fight a war. After all, he had soldiers to do that. Uh, my liege, you need to talk them into siding with you. Uh, uh yes, I'll, um, I'll, I'll do my best. The goblin warlord rose. He had a good physique. He worked out. But he'd never used a sword before. As the door of his cave was kicked open, he rose up and pointed at the intruders. Who dares resist the warlord of the goblins? That's me, if you didn't know that. I do, a strong voice called. Princess Tullanorpasa of the goblin clans, third of my name, channel to the eight gods. Goblins swarmed in, the princess at their head, with a young human warrior by her side. You're no such thing, you're working with a human. Long ago, our people and the humans worked side by side to do the work of the gods. We could have built a great land. But instead, you work them in holes. The princess walked across the long table leading to his throne. You are a weak ruler, ruling by the claim that being strong gives you the right to reign. Tell me, would you be brave enough to fight my champion? The warlord gawked. I, I don't need to prove any of that. I'm in charge. That doesn't sound very strong, a goblin whispered to his fellow, but of course I will. Um, send your champion at me. The princess gestured to Miz. My champion. Miz looked behind her to see who she was pointing at, but there was no one else. The princess kept pointing at her. Sorry, what? My champion, the hero of Hells, slayer of the great beast of the fields. That was one. Defeater of the warlord's royal guard. Miz didn't actually know if that was true or not. The fiercest of the Harloon, Miz. The goblins cheered her name. So uh, she, she raised her sword. The warlord stared at her and then nodded. Okay, yeah, I think I can take a human child on. Bring me weapons, his guards did. He asked for heavy armor. Then he asked for heavier armor. Then he asked for the heaviest armor. And they brought it to him. Finally, they gathered. The warlord in his thick iron armor and Miz in her cloth and leather. The duel began. The warlord tried to move towards Miz, but she ran behind him before he could get anywhere close to her. He was beginning to expect that wearing the heaviest armor he could find was a big mistake when he felt something land on his back. Oh dear. At least he didn't have long to worry before Miz finished him off. The goblin princess led the human slaves back to the village with Miz and Elder Han running out to greet them. The villagers now were ready to fight after it was too late, bringing out their pitchforks. Wait, Elder Ham cried. Miz is the chosen one of legend from the prophecy. He held up the scroll, the same scroll he showed Miz, to the largely illiterate villagers. The goblin warlord has been vanquished. A golden age of peace and prosperity will rise between our people, so says the prophecy, thanks to Miz. The villagers cheered. Miz raised her sword again. As the former captives reunited with her families, she saw her brother and her father running to her mother, tears streaming down their faces. She would join them soon, but first she had to have a word. You didn't mention any prophecy? Hom huh, grinned. Didn't I? I'm beginning to think you made this whole thing up. What did that scroll even say? He laughed. It doesn't matter. What matters now is that this is the beginning of the legend of Miz. Thank you. All right. So uh, tonight, of course, as I'm sure all of you know, is the premiere of the new season of Doctor Who. What? What? I know, right? Yeah. So uh, before we get to the second portion of our show, this is normally the portion we have a guest, but today we're going to read some Doctor Who poems I wrote. You wrote Doctor Who poems? Yes, in fact. <laughs> um, I know, it's so surprising. It's almost like that's why I have this job and anything. Um, also, if I can remind you, we are, you know, uh, here through the graciousness of the Blue Box Cafe and the Southgate Media Group. Um, but I travel here from Indianapolis, Indiana. So if you guys would feel free to help cover some of my costs coming here, I write this entire show myself. I perform all of it also. 
Uh, so if you feel like you would like to ship anything in tonight before you leave, there's Fez up here is more than willing to accept a little bit of tip. So, let's then get on with this. So first off, um, I'm going to read some favorites, but if anyone has a favorite Doctor Who episode up until Black Matt Smith's last episode, just raise your hand and I'll try to fit that one in. Paradise Towers, all right. For one person. For one person. Wow, we, we have a request. All right. You know, this is the first time I've uh, ever been asked to read Paradise Towers. Usually, you know, I, I get lots of new Who poems. Um, this book I wrote, though I'm, I'm going to show myself here for a second, I wrote a poem of every episode of Doctor Who from 1963 to 2013. We'll have to edit that out. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> alright, so, uh, there's a poem about every episode. Um, eventually, once Capaldi finishes his run, I'm going to be uh, adding. Oh, you're going to add to it? Yeah, yeah, there'll be a second awesome. edition with all of this, Capaldi's stuff. This isn't even working, so. Yeah. That, that's fast, so. Yeah, it's not going to work. Yeah, so he did, so yeah. we met him. That We walk up and there's this guy, he goes, yeah, I wrote a poem for every Doctor Who episode that there was. Like, Sorry, I know, thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, so it was, it was fantastic. We're like, oh my gosh, because we were at the Indiana Comic Con, and this is two years ago or three? Three? It was a oh while gosh. ago. But yeah, so, it's cool. We've, we've been lucky to have James as a friend and do some, you know, Wait, we've collaborated and done some stuff. Here. Where's your marketing department? Um, they're sold. So, so really, he's supposed to bring up books for us to yeah. sell here? In I, I have them in my car. Oh, do you? Yeah. So, I brought them one point. Got them. Go okay, good. that's good. So, but yeah, these are awesome. So, sorry to interject. No, no, thank you for uh, making me sound cooler than I am. I appreciate no, it. No, you're not. <laughs> it's always great. So, you wrote a poem about Paradise House. I wrote a poem about Paradise House, and, and I, I'm about to read it. You are a sick man, and here is $5. And you just made him really, really happy. Yes! <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Yeah. So I, I haven't actually been asked to read this one before. This is a first. Uh, all right. So man, I, I hope this one's good. I don't actually remember it. It's been a few years. All right. All right. Episode twenty-four two. Paradise Towers. We never needed anyone but Gum Poppin. Tribal patchwork mohawks and the Allura youth, locked away in a place only Lucifer could say, was an adequate housing establishment. What do you do when the mothers and masters are no cradle, and trusting no one over thirty becomes commandment eleven? You run to concrete jungles and put on war blush. Thank you. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you guys have any requests, raise your hand. I'm going to read... Um, What's your most requested one? My most requested one? Uh, the most requested one is usually Blink, just because it's the most popular episode. Okay, that would make sense. You know. um, the web plan. The web plan, okay. Ooh. It's really good. I, like, know so much about this show, so I can just flip to things. Okay. Ep all right. Episode 2.5, The Web Planet. We are all weird, and nothing, <laughs> and nothing is really so human as to blur the lines of humanity, metamorphosizing into butterflies, and cracking our chrysalises which we webbed ourselves. For this strange, strange land in this strange place for everyone to see our bug-eyed decency. Thank you. Stones of blood. Stones of blood. Stones of blood. Okay. Wow, we've got... Oh, I love that. Yeah, oh, this microphone keeps shifting. Okay, okay. Stones of blood. Going, going. That's <laughs> fine. And of course, this one, I'm like, oh, there we go. All right. Uh, episode 16.3. And by the way, 16.3, um, uh, what I do is I put the, um, that's the season and then the episode number within the season. If you care. 16.3, <laughs> the stones of blood. Footsteps rain and pagan dance steps. 
For round and round with horn god hurdles, another gem, reflecting the energy of the universe into blood and vein stems, dripping to the grass like the rocks of your ancestors. Thank you. Could you do the doctor's wife when you get a chance, whatever you finish? The Doctor's Wife. All right. We're, now we're, we're going right back to the new season. They're messing you up. No, no, it's fine. All right. I'll, I'll, well, I'm looking for this one. I'm going to perform another poem. I wrote some poems about the monsters, too. Uh, so I'm going to perform the poem I wrote for the silence. That was a joke. Nice. I'm now. Um, okay. Hey, it's 745. <laughs> no, really, what time is it? Okay, the doctor's wife. <clears throat> uh, episode 6 4. I was sexy before I was a history book. Marked down for scrap like a disowned sorority. Sexy Tardises all dressed up in pretty dresses and flesh suits. Putting their best breast, eyes, nose, heart, liar, lungs, feet, bones, and venison for the Vortex Ballroom. Dying TARDISES. Wearing away for a surgeon. A doctor who waits on them and takes them away. Thieving TARDISES. Looking for a larcenist. Must love adventure. Spot filled. Thank you. Alright, um... We could go all night if we, you need. If you need. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to read one people really like a lot. Um, it's probably the one that people usually enjoy the most at the reading, so I may as well do it. This is the poem I wrote for Smith and Jones, Season 3, Episode 1. A Jejun platoon on the moon? Why did you assume that would be a boon? Only a loon would attune to the goon, the harpoon, Dr. Yoon. And it's not even noon to June to harpoon the Jejun on the moon. So soon. Don't listen to a tune on your zoon. I know I make you swoon across this lunar dune. You're a doctor? I am too. Fate like runes, bandits together like raccoons, leading to our Jadoon. Smith and Jones to the rescue then. To assume the doom, to do will zoom into the room and entomb us like a womb with a boom on the moon. We'll weave this all up like a loom, this doom, and then no more to do, we'll harpoon and platoons on the moon. I assume. Thank you. <laughs> all right, any more requests from some of you? I got a lot from this first table. We'll wait, we'll wait. We'll wait. Any, anybody else? Uh, yeah, I got doom today. In fact, I was actually right on there before I closed my book, um, because I'm great. <laughs> okay, Doomsday, so 2.13. I can't ever see you, or kiss your eyelids, and my void is, is cached and silent, and I am longing. There are a lot of brains that are sand, and they run through your toes, but I am only there as a ghost, a shadow on the waves. They curl around your feet, whispering past your ear in an unfinished quiet of a god too haughty to ever forget that he spoke. I look. Thank you. Oh, it's the worst. Yeah. It, it, it is going to cry every time with the episodes, definitely. Alright, um, this is since we've got some old school Doctor Who fans here, I think you guys might appreciate this one. This is another one I've never read in a reading before, so I'm just going to go for it. I know, it's fantastic. Alright, this one is called um, Asterix, A Note on the Loch Ness Monster. Atlantis blew up a million times. And there are how many Nessies in the sea? Amazing, there isn't a photograph of one, if not three. I suppose they fought each other to the death and made a few from robot parts, invading the locks to nest somewhere else. We can find so many stray bits lying around. The doctor might lose his license with all the scalpels he left, cutting repeated holes in that wound in time. 
Thank you. All right. Um, uh, so, uh, for those of you at home, uh, this man just asked me, what possessed me to write this book? So, I'll tell the story real fast here. Um, hey, what time is it? It's seven? Okay, thank you. All right, yes, yeah, so what possessed me to write this book? Well, I love Doctor Who, and I've been a fan of it since I was about three years old. Um, one of my earliest memories is we watched uh, the Seeds of Doom, I think. It's the Patrick Troughton one where all that foam that's clearly just soap bubble rises up and coats the entire earth. And I was like, you know, like barely able to speak. But I'm like, I want to do that. So I got like all the Legos out and I like made the like setup. And then I got my dad's shaving cream and I went to town. And I got in so much trouble. Oh man. Um, yeah, so I, I loved Doctor Who from a really early age. And um, when the 50th anniversary came around, I'd already had that one book of poetry published called Cascade. And so that's what I most been most known for up to that point, and I thought, what can I do that no one else has done? Because I know people have already done, like, um, you know, The Amazing About Time by um, Nantane Lawrence Miles, um, you know, Tardis Rudatorum, you know, The Critical History of Doctor Who by Philip Sandifer. You know, those are amazing things that cover all of Doctor Who, and I was like, okay, that's already been done. What can I do that's different? And I looked around, and no one had done that with poetry? No one had really made Doctor Who poetry like this before, so I thought, okay, let's do it. Let's go big or go home, let's write a poem for every episode of Doctor Who, do it for the 50th anniversary of the show. Um, so I did it, put it out as a book, and uh, people really liked it, so I'm happy. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, all right so any last requests here? Anybody? Okay. Was that too long? No, that's the one that takes 15 minutes to read. No, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. that's fine. What do you have that's quick? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read a segment of... Um, I didn't read it. No, no. Kind of no, I've got, I've got a good one. Um, okay, so I've got a poem here, which is actually a segment of the poem I wrote for uh, Time of the Doctor. This one is called To the Daleks. To the Daleks. I never liked you. You talk really slow. Gets better spaceships! What is this? Martians attack? Flying saucers? Come on, Daleks! P.S. You sound funny, and your noses are your eyes. Does that bother you? <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, um... Well, yes, now we're going to return to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, if you guys have any requests before I finish up here, if we have time for the episode, I might do a little more if you want. But we're going to move on with our next segment of the show. So, we're returning to the blue light, which casts us stories through time, space, eternity, alternate realities, William Shatner's voice. And we're getting another broadcast coming in. It's another edition of Monster Hunter Monthly, broadcasting live from an unmarked missile silo in Utah. I'll just go ahead and get the feed hooked up for you guys, and... Hello and welcome. This is Monster Hunter Monthly, and I'm your long-suffering host, Magpie Jones. Today on Monster Hunter Monthly, we're going to talk about Easter safety. After all, this is a holiday where you can really go awry. So, on Easter, as a monster hunter, what really you need to remember is to stay home. After all, you're doing everything else the rest of the year. There are werewolves that are trying to kill you. There are vampires who, well, they're not actually trying to kill you. Just, you know, don't rob a blood bank and you should be fine. So, I'm actually just going to skip today on that and just go right to the reader mail. This is the real part of the show I like. So let's take a look here. Um, Dear Magpie, I love the show. Thank you so much for putting it on. I keep wondering, though, where do you get your ideas from? This is really creative stuff. Has anyone in Hollywood reached out to you? Oh, okay, look, I'm not even going to finish that. This is a serious educational show about monster hunting. I know people love their shows about fictional towns and funny happenings, but this is real life, and I'm not messing around here. Nothing weird. Next message. 
Dear Magpie, I accidentally grew a purple wing, but I wanted a rainbow one. Also, it's coming out of my forehead. What do I do, Callie from Missouri? Well, Callie, that's a great question, and what I actually get a lot here. First off, if you grow any sort of wing you don't want from your body, make sure you keep it away from house cats. Trust me, it goes badly. Second, dip your entire face in orange juice that has enough food coloring in it. It's not orange anymore. Pull your face up and then remove the wing normally. You might have some residual wing bits, but just keep dunking in the orange juice to cock them every day and you'll be fine in just a few weeks. Next letter. Um, ooh, we have yet another update from our friends at the Sons of Sons. If you recall, they've been hunting a monster that's been uh, torching things. Let's check in. He stared at me. I could see his eyes, the tears in them. He yelled across the burning forest. What do you want from me? I want you to stop, I told him. Just leave me alone, you're making it worse. I approached, holding the gun behind my back. I held my other hand out to him. It wasn't the most subtle I could be, but I wasn't sure what else to do. Just come with me. We can figure this out. He looked for a minute like he was buying it. Then he come with me, but then his eyes grew harsh. Anger boiled inside him. You come to kill me, he said. It wasn't wrong. I pulled the gun out. He started to change. His skin turned to plates of swirled black stone. Horns sprouted from his head. His back lit up with fire. I shot at him. The bullet ricocheted off. He advanced on me. I fired. Nothing. He stepped again. He emptied the cliff and I ran. I ran as fast as my legs could carry me. He cried after me. A beast, you'll cry of triumph or anger or both. I didn't stay to find out. I couldn't win, but I knew where he was. And I knew he knew we were after him. I needed a plan. A showdown is certain. Well, isn't that nice? <laughs> we'll check back again with them next month. Till then, don't let any monsters eat you. From all of us here in Utah, good night. Ah, oh, well, uh, thanks, Magpie, for yet another um, amazing uh, update there. Oh, um, right, well, we have another word from one of our sponsors here. Um, this episode of Tales by the Blue Light has been brought to you by Miracola. What do you like? Miracola likes it. Do you like the news? So do we. Hate it? So do we. We are on your side, whatever that is. We are on your neighbor's side. What's that? You disagree with your neighbors on everything? We're on your side. Trust us. Trust us. We agree with you. You agree with us. By Miracola. How can you not? It knows you. Thanks, Miracola. Well, thanks for that uplifting message. All right, well, we're uh, getting ready then to start our last story of the night here. And this one we're going to be leading into, of course, some adventures about uh, time travelers. Ah, right on time for the premiere of a certain time traveling adventure tonight. We have a tale from the 10,000 Dawns about their own adventure by the name of Lady Esculpius. So let's check in on her, on her story, an adventure we're calling B.E.M. Which stands for, of course, Bug-Eyed Monster. The European night was warm, which had nothing to do with the moon and everything to do with the operator of the environmental controls falling asleep at the job. The controlled cool of the night hadn't come inside New Alexandria, and Lady Esculpius was enjoying walking the streets as the populace went out into the accidental warmth. Music filled the narrow streets beneath the dome, and bottles of all sorts were popped open to aid in the celebration. Ace sat down on a bench and watched a group of children out way past their bedtime chase their robotic pet down the street. From her coat pocket, a small lump began to pulse. Not right now, we're in public. They aren't used to seeing factories of crystal. I'm the size of a gold ball, and that man has a custom throne that looks like a tiny dragon following him around next to his head. I'm not going to be out of place. I'm tired of being in your breast pocket. She sighed and opened her coat up. The crystal orb zigzagging around in the air in freedom. She watched it, smiling slightly. There wasn't any real danger here anyways, none worth noting. As soon as she thought that, it was, of course, when the screaming started. She bolted up from her seat and ran towards the noise, the orb zooming behind her and zipping around the pedestrians. As Ace got around the corner, she saw instantly what the problem was. It was a big old bug-eyed monster! 
The thing waved its arms back and forth, and they wobbled like they were made of rubber. It waddled as it walked, its great barrel chest leaning to the side with every step. From its mouth came a low scream, like a voice had been filtered through an ancient world corner. It had a beak. It had a big buck eyes. Its body was coated in big scales. It looked absolutely ridiculous. Even as people ran screaming in terror from it, Lady Ace's face lit up with joy. Pilot, it's a real bug eye monster, like from a bad movie. The oar floated next to her head and did a loop in the air. I'm not sure why that's exciting for you. I mean, it's terrorizing people. Ace grinned dismissively. Okay, but no one's dead. Sure, that kid tripped running from it, but that's only a skin knee. Ace walked over to the kid and pulled her up, grabbing the factory crystal out of the air as she did so. Hey, you can't just... Shh. Now, human child, hold still. The kid looked down in wonder and confusion as Escopius caused the orb to glow and touched it to the wound. It began to seal itself up, healing instantly. Good, now run along while I deal with the monster. She pulled out her hair ties and let her hair billow back in the artificial air flow of the dome. She walked towards the beast, clenching the crystal orb in her hand. My name is Lady Escopius. I don't know who or what you are, but this moon is no danger to you. She held the orb up. You're dealing with power you can't comprehend. And even if you're wobbly, I'll do what needs to be done to... The thing fell over. Oh, I really wanted to finish my speech. I had it all for you now. The orb sighed. I'm sure you'll get another chance. Ace ran over to the monster, whose strange, labored breathing was getting softer. Kneeling down, she touched its side, its inflexible arms wobbling as if to try to touch her. She looked in its open beak and gasped. The orb zoomed next to her. What is it, Lady Ace? Oh. The monster had human teeth inside the beak. The upper and lower lip could be made out, stretched to the top and bottom of the beak and stitched. The noises it made weren't words. That ability had been stripped from it, but the sounds it made became clearer to her in purpose. The thing wasn't making battle cries, but cries for help. Ace stroked it gently, hushing it softly. Pilot? We need to take it on board immediately. This poor being isn't a monster. It's, it's well, someone else is the monster. By the faceless gods, we have to help it. I think it's dying, my lady. She looked at the orb furiously. Get us on your surface now. We're in a public street. People will see. You know the firmament's rules about now. Yes, my lady. The orb grew till it was large enough to touch both Lady Ace and the monster. Then the orb got even bigger, though to everyone except that pair, Lady Ace and the monster got smaller. Then Lady Ace and the monster found themselves pulled in by the orb's gravity, falling through its skies. It wasn't just an orb, it was a moon! Below them, crystal fields spread out in all directions. Towers and spires of the same blue-white crystal jutted out, and huge crystal titans roamed those fields. From under the ground, the white light came. They fell, till it looked like they cracked their legs on the ground, but then they stopped an inch off of it, suspended for just a moment, before dropping calmly to the surface. As they landed, one of the crystal titans came towards them and picked up the monster in one of its gigantic hands. Ace climbed up its back as it walked, and then began bounding towards a central tower, taller than all the others. Outside the orb, two figures shrank to nothing and disappeared as a golf-sized ball-sized crystal grew to the size of a chair, then shrank down to the size of a pearl and flew off into the sky. The child who skimmed her knee watched, her eyes sparkling, her mouth agape. They rushed the monster into the medical center, Ace pulling the gurney that had risen from the ground as fast as she could. The room sprung into action, crystal limbs and implements shooting out from the walls, floor and ceiling, and administering immediate care to the creature. Pilot, test the genetics of the creature. I'm already running a sample. It looks mostly human. Just a second. What do you mean, mostly human? I mean, just a second. There we go. I tested a few different parts of the creature's body. The inside is human. It looks like someone removed most of the outer skin, leaving only a few contact points and cloned a new outer shell for the person? Is is victim appropriate? Yes, Ace said coldly. The new exterior carapace was thrown from a mix of the victim's DNA and that of several animals as well as some homebrew genes. The victim's interwoven with the new exterior will be a 
possible to remove them, but we'll have to craft new skin from them from untainted portions of their DNA. That shouldn't be difficult for us. We have a spaceship that can, is a moon that can turn into the size of a golf ball. I'm the one who has to do it. Speak for yourself. We don't have a resurrection tank on board in case you forgot. I haven't forgotten. I don't like having to go back home every time someone kills me, you know? But I also don't like the kind of low-end bodies you get from aftermarket resurrection tanks. When you, they always seem to get the teeth wrong. Not to mention, yes, yes, but my point is this will be an operation. We'll have to do a lot of stuff manually. Then we'll do it manually. I'm just trying to... Look, it might be easier to let the victim go. They've suffered enough. Ace looked at the wall seriously. It didn't really matter where she looked, since the whole moon was the pilot's body. The firmament took you out of time before your death to pilot the ship. What you in gave you a chance to see stars, gave you a choice to die or live on your own terms. It wasn't much of a choice, but you chose to live. There was silence. The walls glowed as though the pilot was pondering. We begin the operation immediately, but you're not sitting this one out. She rolled up her sleeves. Pilot? I wouldn't have it any other way. Shonda awoke to a gentle thrumming. Her bed was comfortable, but strange. It felt like it was moving beneath her, adjusting to her body for maximum comfort. She tossed and turned. She'd had a terrible dream. She'd been... She reached up and touched her face. She felt her skin, but it felt new, like a baby's skin. Ah, I see you're awake, finally. Here, I brought some cup crumpets. Are they English muffins? I can never tell the difference. Shonda's eyes shot open. She was in some sort of crystal laboratory. She had no clothes. Next to her, a mixed race woman with frizzy hair and a frock coat, infinity scarf, and a slouch cap held out a tray of baked goods, not all of which were English muffins, as well as jams and other toppings. The floor glowed. And then the walls talked, and she bolted off. The bed tried to grab her, but she escaped suddenly, extending arms and ran towards the rapidly closing door to the room. She slipped through and found herself in a place like nowhere she'd seen before. She stopped, staring at the field of crystal and the towering titans that lumbered across it, all lit from the ground instead of the sky. It's quite something, isn't it? I sometimes forget how pretty the whole setup is here until someone like you comes by and reminds me. Shonda looked back. The woman was leaning in the doorway, smiling gently. My name is Lady Sculpius. I'm sorry to startle you. You needed immediate medical care, though. This is a dream, Shonda said. That would be convenient, wouldn't it? I'm afraid not, though. This is a gigantic moon made to transport my people across the universe to fix holes in it. We can also say hi to our neighbors and the universe is next door, but they're not always the best hosts. Some of them it's quite persnickety. Honestly, I think they can get too caught up in their own mythology. Now, why don't you just sit down with me and eat some crumpets, or English muffins, or both, and Pilot can get you some clothes. I have to run a whole moon. You can't just Pilot, she's naked. You're literally walking on my skin. Pilot, he sighed, fine, fine. Lady Ace gestured into the room, and hesitantly, Shonda walked back in. The room totally reconfigured itself. There were now two comfortable-looking chairs with a nice table between them, all crystal, and a bubbling crystal kettle with an equally crystal tea set next to it, as well as the tray of treats. As Shonda sat down, suddenly extra aware of her own nakedness, the wall opened up and a long, wheeled hanger of clothes rolled in. I had to move this out of the wardrobe down 17 stories and remove a wall. So you'd better be grateful, the moon muttered. I'm very grateful, pilot. Thank you. Shonda looked through the clothes. They all carefully picked out outfits in her size, each one complete with everything she'd need for it, from underclothes to accessories hanging next to the outfit in a small bag. She eventually settled in a fairly casual outfit and ducked to the other side of the hangar to get dressed. Lady A seemed totally nonplussed as she was naked or clothed, for what that mattered. Okay, then. Uh, Lady Esculpius. Ace is fine. What's your name? Shonda. Uh, Shonda Knight. Um, well, explain what the hell is going on. I'm afraid you know more than me. When we found you, well, um, you'd been... Modified. Modified. What do you mean? Um, someone had removed your skin and grafted on an exterior carapace to make you look like a bug eye monster from old movies. Memories started to flood back into her mind. 
The doctor's filthy smile, the scalpel's cutting in. No, no, that was a dream. Then this is one too. From the floor rose a table. On it laid the bloody exterior that had been cut off of scaly, beaked, and rubbery. That's... this is real. I'm sorry, Shonda. Get that out of here, please. I don't want to look at it. She held her head in her hands and Ace lowered the table back to the floor. Do you remember what happened? Shonda nodded. Ace came up to her and took her hands on her own. I'm sorry, Shonda, but I need to know what happened. I need you to be strong and tell me everything you can so I can stop this from happening to anyone else. Can you do that for me? Shonda nodded and began her tale. Volunteers needed for medical study. The headline would have made her pass it by. She wasn't that impoverished. Yet. But when she saw the pay list, she could not pass that up. The fine print of the study was clear enough that she might have to make repeat visits and be a long-term study. But that wasn't a problem if the payment transferred. Excited and thinking that of all the bills she could pay, Shonda messaged the contact listed on the ad and set up her appointment. When she arrived at the clinic, it wasn't particularly clean, but what wasn't on the edge of New Alexandria? The receptionist smiled brightly, had her sign in, and gave her instructions to undress in the third room and put on the medical gown. Shonda complied, and in only a few minutes she was escorted into another room with an examination table. It seemed a little much for some injections of medication, but whatever. Mrs. Knight, a man's voice said, and she turned to see a doctor wearing a mask over his mouth and nose. My name is Dr. Heinrich Aldea. I'm the head of the study. Oh, a pleasure. She shook his hand. I thought I'd just be meeting with the nurses. We're doing exciting work. I'd like to be present to make sure it goes according to plan. Now if you lie down on the bed, Mr. Young will get you situated. She did so, and a nurse came by and inserted an IV. Easy. Easy. Uh, the drug's kicking fast, doctor. I know how to sedate the patient. Make sure she's still conscious and just immobile. We need her brain awake to make sure we can do all the nerve connections correctly. Aldea looked over her and picked up a scalpel. Now then, Miss Knight. It is time to see exactly how far I can go in my ass. Just modifying a person like I did before Nosha then he fired me and cast me out here so I would not use it. Personally, I think I can elevate this too hard. So then, you have the honor of becoming my canvas. He cut into her. She felt it. When she awoke, he was laughing. She lashed out at him, and he laughed harder. You can't break out of She surged, her strong but clunky body bursting through the bonds. Oh, I guess you can! Doctor, she's escaping! Stop her! She roared, her words not coming out, and whirled her rubbery arm into a nurse, who flew across the room, slamming into the wall. The medical team scattered as Shonda barreled through the door, and then trampled out the waiting room chairs, and dashed through the front door into the night. Ace sat on the arm of Shonda's chair, listening calmly and rubbing her back as she told her story. Inside, though, Ace was a fireball. We need to stop this Dr. Ardale right now, pilot. Find out where that clinic is. One step ahead of you. We're right above it. Good. Ace got up. It's time to make this right, Shonda. Would you like to come? You don't have to. Shonda shook her head. No, let's do this. I don't want them to do this to anyone else. The receptionist, Kelly B, smiled as the woman walked toward her. Funny style of dress shirt, sure, but a body was a body. Hello, welcome to our test clinic. Do you have an appointment, or are you looking to sign up? I'm looking, the woman said while waggling her eyebrows. For Dr. Aldair, would he perchance be in? Um, she smiled. Um, Dr. Aldero left earlier today, when your assistant, Mr. Young, is in, or I can take a message. Well, that's too bad. The woman held up an orb. You know what to start checking for, pilot? Of course, the orb said. What a weird personal assistant. Still, it wasn't the weirdest. Aldero had been texted during a fraud his for a while, which for a brief time would be the weirdest thing he had seen. Where would Mr. Young be? The woman asked. She pointed down the hallway. Uh, room 24B is his office. Excellent. She threw the orb. Stick him! 
The orb grew to the size of a yoga ball and barreled down the hallway until the sound of a door being broken through echoed through the waiting room. Kelly B. screamed. The woman smiled politely. Now, I have a further question about your establishment, um, such as what ship your Dr. Aldair took off moon, and also if the coffee in that pot is decaf, because if so, I'm skipping it. <laughs> Terry Young panted as the orb chased him through the hallways of the clinic. Suddenly, a woman dropped out of the orb, which was physically impossible, but he couldn't really worry about that. He needed to escape. He thought that before he was tackled to the ground by Shonda, naturally. Miss Knight, what a pleasure to see your treatment. She punched him. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Where's Aldair? He looked as soon as he broke out, took a ship off the road, just in case things went south. Where'd he go? One of his other labs. This isn't the only one. He can't be funding this by himself, can he? With one more than one lab? Young shook his head, and Shonda looked up to see Ace had come dragging the receptionist by the ear. He's not here. They're clearly outside suppliers. I have to take care of them. A side. I was hoping I could get this all wrapped up tonight in a neat package. Wouldn't that have been simple? You can't solve all your problems in 45 minutes, the orb said. I know that. Sometimes it takes 90 minutes. Shonda looked looked down at Young. So, uh, who are your suppliers? The Vigilance, he whispered. The Vigilance are dead. They're boogeymen now. Dead monsters. Not all of them. They survive in the shadows. Ace looked troubled by that. And if it was true, it definitely was. I've already alerted the authorities on Europa. The Index will be here to arrest you and take you into custody. Young and the receptionist cringe. We're just doing what Dr. Aldair paid us to do. Ace rolled her eyes and pulled a sock puppet out and put it on her hand. <laughs> this is Mr. Willoughby. Say hello. Against their better thoughts, Young and B waved. Now, let's see what hear what he has to say. Ace moved the sock puppet's mouth with her hand and spoke with the puppet badly through the corner of her mouth. <laughs> what? Agreeing to do something bad because someone else told or paid you to do it is still bad. Right, kiddos? <laughs> Everyone stared at her. Well, where did the puppet show I hosted last month? <laughs> Anyways, have fun with the enforcers on a room, moon run by the space mafia. I'm sure they'll be very nice. Well, they also do just what they're paid to. Ta-ta! The orb zipped by and Ace and Shonda disappeared just as the sound of index enforcers came through the door. Young gulped and looked at B. This would not be a fun night. Lady Ace and Shonda drank their apple sodas and looked out at the party going on in the square from the roof they were sitting on. New Alexandria was alive and awash with light tonight. I've always loved this city, Shonda said. I, I know, like you said, it's run by the Index, you know, the Space Mafia, but, you know, there's something special about it, you know, aside from the Space Mafia. No, it certainly doesn't throw a bash, Ace said as confetti cannons went off above a crowd of dancing people. Which reminds me, I wasn't sure what to do with this, so I thought you might want it. Ace reached into her pocket and pulled out a credit chip. Shonda took it and checked the balance. She gasped. That's so much, I can't accept this. I don't really need money. I travel through universes and time. Anyways, the owners of that money are arrested or dead. I figured you'd do something cool with it. Shonda smiled and wiped away a tear. Thank you. You've done so much here. How can I ever repay you? Ace winked down the rest of the soda and stood up on the edge of the roof. Just be the best bug-eyed monster you can be. With that, she leapt from the building, her orb following her down till it got below her feet. She shrunk down until she disappeared into the orb, and it flew off into the sky, mixing with the starlight. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, we finish off every show here with a little live radio play. Good. All right. So, um, but first, we're going to go through, we have one more sponsor today. Uh, this month's episode of Tales by the Blue Run has been brought to you by time. Time has passed while you were listening to this ad. Now more time has passed. Now more. Now even more. Time is really persistent about being around, isn't it? Geez, time. Really, get a life. All right. So. Give me the mic, sir. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Are you working? 
I think so. Okay. All right. We all good to go? Sure. Okay. All right. So your ace? Yes. Good. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Is that a reaper? Uh, Lady Esculpius and Lady Ace. Lady Esculpius? Lady Esculpius. Got it? Yeah. All right. So in just a minute, minute we'll begin our radio play. Sorry. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, we could that's use sorry, it. Sorry, I might but that's cool. All right. Yes. <clears throat> All right, so we always finish things off with a radio play. Today, we're going to be returning to the world of our final story and check back in with Lady Esculpius in an adventure we're calling Death to the Dinoids. Our intrepid adventurer, Lady Esculpius. It's probably better if you just say Lady a Ace or just Ace. It's already a lot asking you to pronounce it once. Fair enough. Our intrepid adventurer, Lady Ace, has just landed on a strange new world. There sure are a lot of ruins here. Why is it that the, whenever I run into ruins, I usually go find people who built the civ civilization that built those ruins hiding in it? You think they'd go somewhere else? Maybe get a nice condo or something? <laughs> halt. Who goes there? Lady Ace... Lady Ace Sculpius. Lady Ace. Call me Ace. That's a heck of a name. I don't fool around with it. Regardless, you are trespassing on the land of the Dinoids. The penalty for that is... Death? Really? Death? I mean, look, I just got here, and this is more of a broken down castle than anything. I'm surprised you haven't tried getting in on the tourism industry with it. You know, I'm sure there's a ma market for this stuff. Silence! Oh, you've got a gun. Real original. Never seen one of those before. You're clearly the first person to ever point a gun at me. This is why I bring a folding chair and a beach towel wherever I go. You never know when someone will point a nice, relaxing gun at you. <laughs> Enough! I'm taking you to our leader. Clearly, you're some sort of spy. Of course! You figured it out. How? Okay, I'm going. No more snark for the moment. Lady Ace is taken to a huge meeting hall. The ceiling falling in, the chairs all the damage. Dinoids line the room, looking at their new visitor. I, Visit, am the ruler of the Dinoids. Who are you? I'm Lady Ace. Long story, passing visitor. Not sure why you're so scared of me. I only brought this folding chair, beach towel, and a nice book. Look, it's a romance. <laughs> My ruler, the strange chair she has folds and unfolds. Impossible! No chair could do such a thing. Let me show you a wise one. Oh, wow, it does. That's really convenient. Great, you can keep it. Glad I could contribute to your culture. I'll be off then. Not so fast. You must pay the penalty for trespassing on the land of the Dinoids. Death! Wait, let's just take a step back here and ask. What exactly do you want? Excuse me? I mean, you live in ruins. Every time I drop in, people are living in ruins, or a quarry, or the like. It seems like a lot of your problems would be solved with just a bit of infrastructure. Explain! Like, I have a moon-sized spaceship made of crystal that can t transport construction equipment here. We can rebuild your city, and then you can stop. You know, I don't know what you're doing. But it doesn't matter. I'll get you a sewer system and a Wi-Fi, and you can sort the rest out. You trade us this in exchange for your life? No, honestly, it's just a bit sad. How many times travel? How many time traveler come through here? Quite a lot. We're, we're very popular. They're very good at escaping execution. <laughs> right. Well, let's start with the building, with building things, and move on from there. My ruler, could this be? Could we live in a land with? Houses? It looks like we might. Thank you, Lady Ace. How can we repay you? Other than by not killing you, obviously. Obviously? Well, you could give me back my folding chair. After all, the only reason I came here was to enjoy a good story. Perhaps you could read us your tale. Oh, all right. Ahem. Chapter 1. Elizabeth watched Jason's tanned muscles as he rode the horse back into the pen. <laughs> he dismounted, stroking the horse's mane gently and looked back, flashing her, sm her a smile. She knew not many men were doctors and cowboys, and he had been astronauts, but Jason was truly something else, even among them. 
Die noise! The age of death is over. Keep reading, Lady Ace, because this is truly going to be a golden age. Just wait till you get to the part where they ride the T-Rex together. Uh, romantic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Alright, well, um, that is the end of our show today. So, as I said earlier, um, I come all the way here from Indianapolis, I write the whole show, so if, perchance, you've enjoyed this show, we have this little fez up here, uh, which helps me pay for coming down here, and, or up here, I guess, up, down, what is space? Um, driving here, writing the show, getting all this done. Um, food, food, oh, yeah, food. things, clothes, yeah. you know, that's the Yeah, the nulls, whatever that was. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but we'll be here again uh, next month, as always. And um, after this, of course, we have the airing of the first episode of the new season of Doctor Who. Woo! Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks yeah. for coming out. So, guys, a yeah, round of applause for James. That's all for tonight from the Blue Light. Come back next month and we'll be sure to offer you more tales of the fantastic into the dark depths of your world, the brightest lights of your fancy, and the biggest dreams of your future. For all of us here at the Blue Box Cafe in Elgin, Illinois, keep your blue light shining. There's plenty more to see. Woo!